Flaster Greenberg presents New Jersey's Site Remediation Reform Act, a practical approach. This program was recorded November 18th, 2009 at Flaster Greenberg's Conference Center in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. In this segment, the 500-year Delta, a paradigm shift, and some strategies to consider with Franklin Riesenberger, a shareholder in Flaster Greenberg. Good morning. Uh, Marty alluded to permits. Uh, the uh, additional information on permits will not be coming out until January in terms of their forms. Uh, <clears throat> I can only describe this as a 500-year delta, and that's the term that's usually used to describe something that uh, is monumental, history is changing, we're going forward into a new world. And you jump into it, and the DEP, many of you have taken some courses uh, for LSRPs, has called this the big jump. And they're claiming that there's gonna be all kinds of uh, safety valves available uh, for you, and the DEP is gonna be very cooperative in trying to make this work, because it has to work. And I believe that that will take place. One of the dilemmas that you have is if you have an existing case that's already has a case manager or is filed in some way, whether you proceed under the old or you want to go to the new. And sometimes you may question whether you're even eligible for the old, which is the NFA. <clears throat> if you have had oversight costs which have been billed to the client, those are the pesky oversight costs that nobody ever wants to see and get. That gets you an automatic pass into uh, NFA land and if that's what you want to decide to do. Uh, if you've got a case manager, that gets you an automatic pass into NFA land, once again, if that's what you want to decide to do. Uh, there is some discretion in terms of jurisdiction under NFA that the DEP has to recognize <coughs> that you have indeed phoned in a site and maybe have taken some remedial action along the way, you have to argue that. It's another way of getting into the <coughs> NFA. But how do you make the choice? What are the uh, variables that you want to consider in deciding whether you are going to go into the old or the new, if you could go into the old and, and stay into the old? Rest assured that the old still exists and uh, would follow the old uh, uh, rules and regulations, oversight rules, and others. Now, let's examine first in trying to figure out <clears throat> whether we want to go into the new or, or stay in the old, if you have that opportunity, uh, what this is. <clears throat> I call this the big dump. Not as a landfill uh, with the word dump, but as a transfer. This is a huge transfer of responsibility. And along the way, I view shifting roles. The attorney's role, I think, expands. Uh, it becomes a communicator with a client, uh, becomes an environmental evaluator, even more so than ever, becomes a strategist. Uh, in addition to being a director, the attorney becomes a producer because the attorney's got to now see well in advance of what the timelines are, what the budget may be, what things are going to, and how they're going to play out. So this, this, this role changes. Most importantly, the attorney is the last man standing when it comes to being the confidant of the client. The NJDEP, the NJDEP's role changes remarkably. The NJDEP now becomes a facilitator for the most part of uh, timeline considerations and action points of what's going on in the matter. It also becomes a prime policy maker and guidance issuer. The DEP has introduced a tour de force here because of so many other guidance documents that were issued previously, now those guidance documents being incorporated, or incorporated into the guidance documents now being uh, issued uh, have some uh, meaning in terms of a regulation. And the DEP is going to issue so many documents that are guidance documents. Whether they're going to withstand legal challenge is something that we'll, we will see later on. It also means that the DEP is more transparent. It'll try to indicate to you with these guidance documents what it wants, what is acceptable, what it wants to do. Instead of having that determination made in some kind of a meeting that you don't attend of various DEP personnel, 
there will be some more transparency. I view this role as a key role, the non-LSRP environmental consultant. <clears throat> Mitch mentioned earlier that you may want to hire another consultant. It may be a LSRP consultant or a non-LSRP consultant. But I look at this role as huge because somewhat, somewhere along the way, the client and the attorney have to have a best friend. And this is going to become part of the evaluation of a site, part of the evaluation of whether to go new or old. And uh, I believe that there will be some formal alliances. I can see some law firms that have large practices bringing in some, uh, some non-LSRP as in-house. I can see there be forming a, for, formal alliances between uh, contractually because you want to protect the attorney-client privilege between attorneys and non-LSRPs. Therefore, in your books, if you can draw a line between attorney and non-LSRPs, there's going to be more of a relationship there. And of course, NJDEP and LSRPs, there should be a line drawn between those two because the LSRP's role will only be successful to the extent that the, there are communications provided by the DEP and back to the DEP of what's working and what is not working. Let me just talk a little bit about the LSRP. Whenever I enter a room now and I have an environmental consultant, the first thing I ask is, are you an LSRP? I must ask that question because I don't know whether what I say is going to inadvertently have an inadvertent consequence of all of a sudden the DEP being advised that there's something that is confidential between the client and the, the attorney that is going to be going up to the DEP. These are unintended consequences. So the first thing you got to do is identify who the person is and what status they have and you may not be able to talk to them as freely as you might want to. This is going to be decided on a case-by-case -case basis in terms of whether it goes to the old or whether it goes to the new. And in doing that, please realize that um, there are some items that I think are going to be clear in terms of what we can expect if you take the old or the new. I call this the twilight zone. And the reason I call this the twilight zone is because there was that one episode that you may remember where a person who loves to read in the library is the only person left on earth in the Twilight Zone episode. And he stumbles and falls on the library steps and breaks his glasses and there's nobody to read the books. Uh, just because there is an old way that's going to be continuing, uh, it's going to be slowed down because the DEP will transfer people from the old to the new. They want to make it work, they're going to take people there and the items that haven't been read for years and, or, or maybe only partly read or where, wherever they, they stand will continue to be met with minimal uh, people there assigned to the, the old N NFA track. Therefore, if you have um, situations in which uh, the uh, natural attenuation is taking place and you want to move things along, let things go, no, just pay your oversight fees, for another uh, two years, you're going, to have, you're going to have that option. On the other hand, there are going to be some sites where you feel like you want to get this done and you want to proceed forward. Again, it, it has, careful evaluation needs to be made as to uh, whether this is a good idea. Assuming you go the fast track, you will be able to go quickly and through the, through the LSRP process. So that is a very uh, important consideration and it is the gift of time either slow or fast. <clears throat> the rules of ethics are critical here. If you look at this new world here, assuming you have a new case, there's an ISRA case or there is a, uh, a, a, new, a new discharge, the rules of ethics, which Mitch discussed, are section 16A through Z. I, I, I implore each and every one of you, I haven't done so already, to read those rules of ethics. Uh, they are very, very important. We are going to list those rules of ethics as far as the engagement letter. You have to communicate to the client what they're getting into, uh, what an LSRP means, and that is the pineapple rule. Let me explain to you the pineapple rule. Mitch and I once had a client, and it had to do with a very technical federal transportation issue, uh, and it's the weather delivery of pineapples was rejected in time. And we told them there's no way you're going to win this case. We got a good settlement and we told them you should settle a case. We wrote letter after letter, settle the case. I even got up one day and I said, Bob, make believe I'm standing on my desk. 
and you have to settle this case. He didn't settle the case. He says, it's a principle of contracts. And he went to trial. After three days of trial, the motion was made by the defendant for a uh, directed, directed verdict. And of course, there was a directed verdict and the client lost. He came into the office the next day and said, why didn't you tell me? If there's one thing that I can tell you today, it's be aware of why didn't you tell me. Your engagement letters have got to show in and, and, and show that the client has been advised uh, of, of what these rules of ethics are. Just very quickly, immediate environmental concerns gets reported to the DEP. Discharge has occurred and the contaminated site just gets, gets reported. The LSRP shall correct all deficiencies of prior documents. The LSRP shall report a deviation from the remediation plan and, and the client is deviated from it. These are things that have to be explained very, very carefully. And you also got to explain what happens if you have one miss, the one miss rule. Uh, you've got to tell your clients about this. You're, you, you are a big communicator as an LSRP and as an attorney. Forms. Forms. You're going to get forms. There's 35 forms now on the web. Five of them have been uh, produced in PDF fashion. There's going to be at least 50. Pat's right about that. And there's even a form for deviation. This is the form where, where if, if there's a deviation from the um, conduct that's expected, uh, that's what's going to happen. Okay, what is it? Marty went into it. The new world. Now we've got a new case. We've got an ISRA case or we've got a new discharge. We're in the new world now. And this is uh, what an RAO is. Uh, to date, we've been able to figure out 16 different combinations of uh, RAOs with various conditions, if you want to use the old term. Uh, the scope of remediation, this is very important. You're used to AOCs, uh, and those AOCs may be tanks, systems, or separate units. Not so in the future under the new world. Under the new world, you take an X right now, and you cross out the S, you cross out the S, and you cross out the S. Every little item is going to have to be reported, except if you have a system, but you might have two or three systems, uh, as far as being an AOC. And that'll have some strategic impact on, on how you may approach these cases. Early on, you got to figure out what the requirements are on a timeline basis. You're no longer the, the director. You're the producer now. That's for the LSRP and for the attorney as well. You've got to go ahead and say, okay, these are the timelines that have to be met. This is what's going to be happening. The deadlines are regulatory or mandatory, as we discussed earlier in uh, Adana's presentation. Uh, there are requests for extensions that can take place. It's very important that the extension requests are made in a timely fashion and that you have a reason to extend. Uh, the grant and loan applications to the NJDEP is a shall. The DEP shall grant an extension in the event those loan applications are made. One of the advices that you can give is that in the first instance, the second day you have the file, get those grant and loan applications going to the NJDEP. It's very important if the client doesn't have money and needs to uh, proceed uh, to, to get money that, that that take place right away. Similarly with litigation, this is a shall, this is a shall, uh, this is a discretionary item in the DEP to, to, to allow there to be a, a, a timeline deadline extension. And um, uh, Donna went over the considerations that the DEP had uh, in, in, in determining whether there shall, whether it has the discretion uh, to proceed and, and uh, grant a, um, a, 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 a timeline change. And you've got to go over those early on if you're going to know that you're going to have probably litigation that's going to fund this effort. And those are uh, compliance with regulatory uh, time frames, the results of receptor evaluation, potential risk of public health. There are six of them that are in Donna's slide, and they're very important because early on in the case, it may be, it's going to be critical not only to start the litigation early, to show the, the DEP that there is litigation pending, 
but to determine in your management of the site what areas of those six considerations that the EP is going to take, is going to take into account can be directed. In other words, um, the ongoing operations, are they causing any more difficulties? Maybe there's a receptor evaluation that may be dangerous. You may want to address that first to show that you're going to be able to make progress in this area uh, that will, uh, in, in the consideration, in the areas of consideration that the DEP is going to consider if, if, if they're going to, be, uh, going to be granting based upon their discretion and extension to the mandatory deadlines. Presumptive remedy. I think you always have to consider, no matter what the site, uh, whether a presumptive remedy is appropriate. And that's because... Um, the presumptive remedy is going to uh, give some finality uh, to the cleanup, and also uh, it's, it's, it's something that you may want to plan ahead and tell the client, now what future uses do you have to the property? Are they going to be schools? Are they going to be some of the other sensitive areas? And by the way, there is a term which says other sensitive areas. Believe me, we're not done yet. I mean, I can see senior citizens... Uh, uh, old age homes, if you call them, um, uh, continuum of care communities also being included in this in, a, a, at some time. I'm just going to go very quickly through this. There are annual fees. The annual fees uh, are based upon the number of AOCs and the media. These annual fees are going to change dramatically depending upon how many AOCs, CAT 2, CAT 3, CAT 4, and you want to probably seek to reduce them and find out in an analysis early on how many of these can be quickly reduced if you're in this program. There's also $1,400 for each media. As, it, as mentioned up here, the media is, the, is, is one of the ways of, of generating, of, 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 of measuring the fees. And on the sediment, it will be considered to be a media at, it, at issue and in play unless you are able to, to rebut it. Tags. Our technical assistance grants are going to be grant, they're going to be given to uh, nonprofits that are 501c3 obtained or in the process of obtaining. These, the, these groups have to be incorporated, and there's only going to be one application that will be recognized if there's two apps that the EP will pass on it. But this points out a very important point over here, and that's outreach. It's only going to be granted in the event there's a need to have an LRC uh, be provided with $10,000 for each phase to educate the community uh, organization about what's going on. So outreach becomes a strategy also in terms of what your client may want to do to make sure that there is sufficient communication. Just in this instance, the, NLS, the LSRP, uh, if, if, if hired in the capacity under a TAG grant, will not be able to develop primary data, but is to communicate. And uh, I wanted to just thank some people. First of all, thank you for coming. We look forward to your questions. We hope that this has been a uh, very uh, fruitful uh, endeavor, but I wanted to thank Jason Springer. Jason, if you can just raise your hand. Jason has been terrific in helping us put this together, and Janet Levine, I don't know if Janet's here, and also uh, Karen DePrima, uh, and of course everybody on this panel. Uh, we did a lot of work to put this together, and I just want to tell you, you did great. We hope you enjoyed this program brought to you by Flaster Greenberg. For more information, call 856-661-1900 or visit flastergreenberg.com. This program was produced by Professional Podcasts in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, on the web at professionalpodcasts.com. For Flaster Greenberg, this is Steve Lubetkin. Thank you for joining us, and take good care. <laughs>